Okay, it looks like we're live. Um, I had some <laughs> technical issues trying to get this thing going to post into the group. I have to have an app setting that is um, set in place. I just went online real quick on Google. It's no longer offered, so I'll have to figure out um, you know, what to do in relationship to getting this into the group. Hey, Mike, how are you, buddy? Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about a certain kind of a personality type. I call this the annoying cricket because it's like having a little cricket sitting on your shoulder annoying you all day. Um, this happens often. Um, a lot of my clients, you know, run into this. And I was debriefing somebody this morning. And in that debrief, um, there was the proverbial annoying cricket. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I had to work with them through that and explain to them what that looks like, what that means. So you may have an annoying cricket and we're going to find out, you know, if that's true. And I'm going to show you how we find out. So first of all, we have our TARP assessment that we use to discover some of these things. Um, we created this not too long ago and, um, I'm going to explain a little bit of what that does. So this is a behavioral assessment and it measures your primary emotions, which determine your primary or your behaviors. Um, the next, um, uh, report we're going to be looking at this morning or today is the IMO report. The IMO report is an integrated view of your emotions as they relate to your worldview. Uh, that's a little complex maybe for you, but um, that's what it is. So we measure seven separate value elements and then we measure them on a scale of zero to 100. And then what we do is we integrate them as a whole to create a framework. And this really is what I sometimes call your passion palette. So the passion palette is what drives you forward. We call that a consistency. So we create these consistency graphs and we see where you consistently lean and place your attention to in the world. And if those emotional needs are being met in your workplace, in your family life or wherever, then your brain feels really good and it lessens what's known as uh, brain tension and it's called tension reduction. And so the more reduced tension you have in your brain, the better flow you're going to have in your life. And it's important that you understand what that means and what that looks like. So we'll go over that. Um, we're going to talk about two things here. I call this the human problem. And the human problem is about two things. Number one, it represents our own needs and our own desires. What do I need in the world? What do I desire in the world as a person who lives in a separate existence? So in other words, this is all about my needs, my wants, my desires. Um, and, you know, uh, it doesn't have anything to do with anybody else. What are those? So we can determine what they are through our reports, um, which is very helpful for you. Hi, Diane. Hi, Deanna. Um, and so uh, it's real important that you understand how this works. So the problem is, well, what we call the human problem, is that there are expectations being placed on us by other people. Okay, so this is interesting because um, there's my expectations for myself and then there's your expectations on me. And so if you are married or you have a relationship of any kind, you have your own personal expectations, but you also have a partner that has expectations when it comes to being with you. And so maybe your partner expects you to be home at a certain time. And then if you're not home, it creates a human problem. And so it's, hey, Mary, um, it's very powerful and very important to understand what kinds of human problems you're running into based upon the relationships you have. Now, when we're at work, we have a relationship with subordinates, we have relationships with peers, we have relationships with leaders, maybe it's a boss, 
or something like that. What are their expectations? Okay, so there's my expectations. I want to sleep in today. Well, then there's the company expectations. I need you at work at 8 o'clock because we have an important meeting. That creates a human problem that's going to cause you to have to orient your emotions in order to meet the expectations that are outside of yourself. And so being aware of what your own expectations are and what the expectations of everybody else is, is emotional intelligence. Now, being able to walk that fine line and meet your individual needs and the needs of those around you is what makes you an expert in human behavior. And so all that to say, uh, the human problem exists for all of us. And hey, Stuart, and, uh, and so we have to be aware of, am I meeting my expectations for myself? And am I meeting my expectations for somebody else? Okay. So what happens is we have to choose to do something. And this is something that takes place that we call on purpose or intended. Now there are four orientations to choose from and that's all there is. There's no more than that. Every human being has four orientations that they will turn to in an effort to meet the outside expectations that are being placed on them. So I have a manager, he has these expectations, maybe I think they're unreasonable, maybe I think they're super easy, I don't know where you're at, but we can measure and find out. And so, you see, you have these expectations being placed on you, and what is that doing to you emotionally? Because your emotions are everything. Don't let anybody tell you anything different. Um, you have an emotional center and everything stems from that. And so we have to pick and choose certain behavior orientations in order to meet the expectations outside of us. Now, we have a natural character base and that's graph two in any DISC report or our TARP report as well. Graph two represents your character base, which is what your brain has learned to do over the many years you've been alive in an effort to succeed and survive certain environments. First big environment you will be responsible for negotiating is the home life. That's the first environment. So when you're born, you're born into a family of guardians of some sort, whether they're parents, whether they're foster parents, whatever they are, but that's a, 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 an environment that you're born into and your brain has to negotiate that environment. And it negotiates that environment based upon the cardinal traits you were born with, which come in through your genome. 40% of who you are is inherent. It's called temperament. So we inherit certain traits. And if you've had children and more than one, you know what I'm talking about. They're different early on, same parents. So they're born with these cardinal traits uh, that they have. And then the environment begins to polish the existing traits that we have. So think about polishing a rock. When I was young for Christmas, I got a rock polishing kit back when Christmas presents were awesome. Um, and so it was a little tumbler and you could put, you could just go around outside and find little rocks and put them in there and it will tumble them with some grit. And over time it would polish them and they'd look a little bit different than they were when you pulled them out of the ground. That's what our environments do. So you may dig up a diamond and it doesn't look very great, but you work on it and you polish it and you chisel it and you work it. Now it looks completely different, but it's the same diamond. So we are the same person when we are born and then our environment, like a rock tumbler, puts coarse material around us, which are positive and negative circumstances, and they begin to polish the stones that already are and together it creates a style. I don't want to get too deep into all that because I only got 45 minutes left. Okay, this is going to be so good. So we got our natural character base, which is unconscious to us. It's unconscious. We don't know we're this way. We're not really thinking about it. It's just how we're wired. And it's about the natural energies we have available to do anything in the world. Okay, so it's important that you understand that. So what are the four orientations? Well, the four orientations are taking, attracting, responding, and preserving. Those are the four orientations. Uh, and you are going to um, relate to one, two, or three of these. 
not four. You're going to relate to one, two, or three of them automatically because they're already in your character base. Okay, so this is huge. Um, uh, and so uh, what are your favorite ways to orient in shared existence, which is what you're going to emotionally do in an effort to meet whatever needs are coming your way from somebody else. These are called expectations. All right. Now, um, uh, another thing I want to say. TARP stands for Taking, Attracting, Responding, and Preserving. That's what the TARP report is all about. We measure how you orient in shared existence. And the big question is, how is it working out? <laughs> okay, because sometimes it doesn't work out very well. And sometimes it does. Now, what you have to understand is the DISC report's been around for many, many, many years. Hey, John, it's been around for many, many, many years. It's never been updated in about 40 years, and we are updating it. So that will be coming out. I just spoke to the uh, programmers um, just recently. We're getting ready to do it, and we are going to update DISC. It's going to be called DISC Pro for those that want to sell it, that are you know companies that sell assessments. Uh, for us, it's going to be called the TARP report, but this thing's going to be on freaking steroids. Um, and so it's going to be so powerful. Um, and I'm, and I'm going to say, I don't know that it's going to have ever been done before. What we're going to do, I don't know that it's ever been done before. I've written 2,400 statement sets for this report. Um, they're done. I've got them written. It's just a matter of putting all this together. So that's coming. So let's move on here to some fun stuff. Let's get rid of this. So, you, you, TARP is about taking a tracking response and preserving, so you need to know. Okay. Uh, okay. This is the annoying cricket. So, the graph on the right, it says DISC. You can see the DISC letters there. D for dominance, I for influence, S for submissive, and C for conscientious. And God only knows how many other abbreviations there are out there for all that, but it's all the same. Doing, feeling, helping, thinking. That's another way to look at it. Mad, glad, sad, scared. That's another way to look at it. Um, and so I could give you those for 30 hours of the different things we could call this. But all it's doing is measuring your four primary emotions, which are anger, optimism, patience, and fear. Period. It's that simple. But not everybody can read these, unfortunately. If I had, I've had people that have done these 10 times. And they do it with me, and they're like, what the hell is this? And I said, it's a disc report. They're like, are you kidding me? You see, this runs so deep that you, you can't believe it. Um, and so it takes a real expert in human behavior to, to pull everything out. I debriefed somebody for six hours one time. That's how long I was able to get information out of two graphs like this. So there's a lot here. So this was a graph I debriefed this morning. Uh, before this here, uh, first thing, at 9 o'clock this morning, Central Time, I did a person, and these are their numbers. And so it was very interesting. So let's take a look at it. So let's look at the natural self that's unconscious, the character base, low dominant, high influence, high submissive, moderately high fear, D-I-S-C. You can see it on the screen there. Um, so their greatest strength or their most... Uh, 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 I'm, my mind is racing, so hold on a second. Their most intense emotional piece is optimism, influence. So this is very visceral. Okay, When you have a high influencing emotion or a high optimistic trait, it's a visceral limbic piece. It, it, it's a very, very emotional. Um, um, and how it works is, if you ever walked across your front yard and looked down and saw a garden hose, but your first instinct was to think it was a snake, that's your limbic system. You look down and you're like, oh my God. And then a few, few seconds later, you realize that's a garden hose because you look and you can see it's attached to the house or it's a little oversized or it's got a colorful stripe on it or something like that. So your brain works like this. Emotions first, logical reasoning second. And it's like that with every animal in the world. So we are higher animals. We have a neocortex which separates us from the lower animals. And what that does is it causes us to be able to plan uh, and conspire uh, and imagine and predict and things like that. Um, 
Uh, if a wolf gets his foot caught in a trap, he just chews it off. He doesn't go, oh my God, this is going to be really so painful. What am I going to do now? Is there somebody I could call? Dang, it's hot out here. Like, that, that's not what wolves do. They just free themselves in an instinctive way. Uh, uh, and so, anyway, I don't want to get too deep into that. Uh, uh, so, uh, what happens here? Who says, I thought he was going to get into cognitive behavioral therapy for a second. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to do that. Um, so what happens is, uh, the limbic system is the most instinctive part of your brain. Sometimes we call this affective primacy, uh, postulated by Robert Science. Um, and what that means is we basically make a fundamental decision before all the data is in. In other words, I determine this is a snake before I actually know it's a snake. And so people that are very low on dominance and very high on influence and very, very low on submissiveness and conscientiousness or patience and fear are very quick decision makers, very, very quick decision makers. And so they're limbic driven, so they're making determinations before they have all the data. So they act and speak before they think, period, end of story. Um, and so that's because they have active pieces that are more prominent than their passive pieces when it comes to their emotions. So D and I are active, S and C are passive. So looking at this profile here, we have a low D, so that's dominance is low, so this becomes amiable. So the opposite of dominant is amiable or peaceable or agreeable. Um, and so optimism is high. Three fears that come with optimism, I call this the I triangle, is the fear of not being liked, there's the fear of failure, and there's the fear of being mischaracterized. And so every time you interact with a person, you're unconsciously trying to keep from not being liked, failing, and, and, and not being understood. And what does that mean? So if, I, if, you heard, if you're a high influencer and you heard that somebody you respected thought you said something negative and you didn't say it, you'd want to fix it immediately. And that shows you if you are an influencing type. And so, uh, uh, so this person has optimism and patience and fear. The annoying cricket is that S line, that green line just over the edge of 50, which means it's in play. Anything over 50 is in play. That's the annoying cricket. Um, and so it's really important that you understand what that annoying cricket does. So think of a cricket sitting on your shoulder, whispering in your ear all the time and whispering things like this. Are you sure you want to go in there? Are you sure you, they're not going to get mad at you if you do that? Are you sure it's safe to go in there? Because after all, I know they told you to see, to meet them in their office at two o'clock, but the door's shut. So it's always causing you to second guess and it, and it, and it causes you to become hesitant. So hesitancy is found in the patient's emotion. That's why patient people tend to be hesitant as a rule. And because they're hesitant, they become loyal. So we think they're loyal because they're hesitant. Hesitance is all about non-flexibility. So patient people don't flex well. They're like made of glass. You flex them too much, they break. But people that have no patience are hyper flexible. They can switch lanes and they can switch gears on a dime. They, they, they can move and change very quickly because that's what we call multitask ability. Now your brain's not wired for multitasking. I don't care who you are. Your brain's really designed for two things, kill and eat and not at the same time. And so we're not wired for that. But because of our culture, because we live in the year 2018, and we're no longer living hundreds of thousands of years ago when all you did was eat and, and catch food. Um, uh, we now have phones and meetings and all these things, so our brains are changing. Um, and so what happens is um, uh, when you uh, have to start multitasking, things are shutting down and you become less good at certain things and better at others depending upon how you're already wired. So you're either wired for some kind of a multitask ability or you're not. Super important to know if you are or not because if you get into a situation where you've got to multitask, it isn't going to work. You're not going to like it and you're going to experience brain tension. So look at this person switching into their intended self. So this is conscious, which means TARP is on purpose, graph one in our profile. 
And so look at the changes they're making. Their anger, their dominant, drops down. So taking becomes absent. So taking means I see all things of value is lying outside of myself. And if I want any of it, any of it, I got to take it by force. So everything and everyone becomes a means to an end. And people and things are only seen for their usefulness. And so people become like a car jack. Um, I need the car jack so I can change the tire. As soon as I'm done changing the tire, I put the car jack away. I don't need you anymore. Okay. This is kind of a Donald Trump style. Um, so uh, everything's about its usefulness. Everything's task oriented. This is why Donald Trump walks ahead of his wife and it looks so terrible. It looks so discourteous. It looks impolite. It's because his brain's thinking, I got to open the door. I got to go inside. I got to meet that person. I got to sit at that table. And everything else on the peripheral is left out, including his wife. So he walks, he even walked ahead of the queen because he's so on task. He's so task driven and less people driven. He doesn't know people are there. Okay. So that, 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 there's so much there I could talk about, but that's, that's part of what that is. This person here knows everybody's there because their people awareness is in the eye and it's 98. It's peaked. So they're hyper aware of what other people are thinking about what they're doing and saying. So everything they do has to go through the filter of what is everybody going to think? Obviously, Trump doesn't do that. He doesn't know if anybody's thinking about what he's doing or saying, nor does he care because his eye is about a 21. And so it's extremely low. So he has no awareness about what anybody's thinking about what he's saying and doing, which is why he says stupid things. Um, he, he just doesn't have that awareness of it. Does that mean he's dumb? No, it means he has no awareness of what people are thinking about what he's saying and doing. That's all it means. So you can't, you can't enter into these dynamics intentions coming from you because we don't see people as they are. We see them as we are. So you're thinking if I was acting like that, it'd be because I was a full blooming moron. He's acting like that because that's how his brain is wired and has nothing to do with moronic behavior. It's just how his brain is wired. All right. All right. I want to get off Trump. So um, attracting is up still. Um, it's about a 55 there. Responding is high and preserving is high. Responsive people see all things of value as lying outside of themselves. And if they want it, they only believe it can be received from an outside source. What does that mean? It means if I don't give it to you, you can't have it. So imagine you have a pen and I need a pen right now. And let's say uh, I look at you and say, excuse me, are you done with that yet? And you look at me and you're holding the pen. You're not writing anything. You just look at me and say, no, I'm not. Responsive people don't know what to do at that point because they didn't, they weren't able to receive it from that source because they're not a taker. They don't know what to do. There's no other options. And so they say, oh, okay, I'm sorry. And then they go to ask somebody else, are you done with that pen until somebody gives them one? And then they receive it. A taker just looks at you and says, you're not using it and takes it right out of your hands. Starts using it, gives it back, says thanks and walks away. They just take it. And so this is the difference. Um, and so uh, preservers see the world as cold, cruel and dark and they believe there's not much good out there. So they hunker in the bunker and hoard everything they have to protect it from hostile entities. And what this means is everything out there or everything in here has to be protected like in a barred castle. So if you have a person like this in the IT department at your work, what do they do? They protect all the passwords. Nobody can see them. Nobody can have them, including the owner of the company. And they, they will hold the whole place hostage because they're protecting all the passwords from all the hostile entities outside. That's how they think. They're preservers. Or sometimes we call them emotional hoarders. This is Al Gore, for heaven's sakes. He's a preserver. What is he doing? Protecting the world from all the bad people. That's a preserver. So you can spot it just like that if you understand how the brain is working. So this person goes from being moderately preserving in a C. So this is like playing soccer, you know, in a soccer field with some potholes in it to playing soccer in a minefield. So optimism drops and fear of errors and mistakes increases dramatically. That's the C turning into a very tall P. So now imagine driving a car. Imagine it being a sunny day. We're looking at graph two, the DISC graph. 
I imagine you driving carefully, paying attention, adjusting your mirrors. You got your seatbelt on. Everything's fine. Now you turn down a road. It doesn't look very familiar. Your brain starts wondering, okay, where the heck am I? This doesn't look really familiar to me. All of a sudden, it starts getting dark. Now it starts raining. Now it's raining sheets of rain. Your windshield's starting to fog up, so you're fumbling for the radio to turn it down. You put on the defroster. You put your windshield wipers on high. You slow the car down, both hands on the wheel, 10 and 2. You don't want to go into a ditch or hydroplane. This is what this profile is doing. The fear is going up. The optimism is going down. The taking is going away. Preserving and responsiveness is climbing. And all of a sudden, they're like, oh, my God, what's going on? So this person's going to work. Instead of being, oh, this is such a fun day, they're becoming very perfectionistic. It's like they're dismantling a bomb. Good or bad? Well, I don't know. How's it working out? You see? How's it working out? So this is what we have to realize. Like sometimes it works out well. Sometimes it's not working out well. What does that mean? I'm a bad person. I don't have a good graph. No, it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with your environment. So think of human behavior and human emotion like clothing. Like what if you're wearing shorts and a t-shirt and you're playing volleyball on the beach in Hawaii? How's that work out for you? Well, really well. But if you're working on the Alaskan pipeline in December, it's a real problem. But it has nothing to do with your clothing. It has everything to do with where the clothing is. Where is your behavior playing out? What we like to do and what we like to see is not change who you are, but change the environment where you are. So the greater degree, you're, if you're wearing shorts and a t-shirt, the best place for you to work is the beach. I don't mean literally, but I'm, I'm talking environmental feelings. If you're at the beach working, you don't even know you're working. You're just having a great time. 84% of the work population is waiting on their dream job and they're not happy with the environment, whether it's the people or the things or the circumstances in that environment. They're just not really happy with it. Most people are green, like on this graph. So they have a cricket on their shoulder saying, you sure you want to quit your job? What happens if you can't find another one real quick? You're going to go broke. Like that's what happens. They get the cricket denying them entrance anywhere else for fear of errors and mistakes. And so people stay where they are for security reasons. Okay? And so um, I, I, I know I'm, I might be getting all over the place because I'm just talking off the cuff here. Um, and uh, I'm t I know I'm talking fast. I, I apologize for that. Um, but um, I, I'm trying to help you see, you know, what, 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 what's going on here. Okay. Let's look at something else. Um, so our active and passive emotions. So active emotions are red and yellow, yellow and red, red or yellow solo, or any combination thereof. Those are the active emotions. These are the emotions that cause us to think ahead, to think forward, to move forward, and to seek opportunity and outcome. Okay, that's the active emotions in our brain. So people that are all red, all yellow, or all a combination of each other in any sense, their brain is a larger windshield. And because blue and green tend to be low for those people, that's the rearview mirror. So some people have a large windshield and no rearview mirror. What does that mean? It means they become trial and error learners. Because they only look to the future, they don't look to the past. Okay? So, if you're only looking to the future, and I call you up and say, Hey, you want to go to the beach this weekend? Your brain goes, Oh, opportunity. Yes, that sounds wonderful. So, your brain's in the future, it's moving in the future, it's thinking in the future. Yes, that sounds great. Awesome. Hang up the phone. Friday night at 10 o'clock, they happen to be browsing through their calendar on Google for no apparent reason. They go, Oh my God, I got an appointment. Saturday, I, I can't go to the beach. So they're trying to text me at 11, telling me, sorry, dude, I can't go. And I'm like, what the hell's wrong with you? Like, how did you not know this? Well, they had no rear view mirror. If they had a rear view mirror, they went and went into the past, checked out their calendar to see what they put into it in the past to see if their future was safe to approach. You see, this is why active people make a lot of mistakes, misspell words, send emails to the wrong people. They've got no rear view mirror. Now let's topple this on its head, the passive people. All they have is rear view mirror, but no windshield. Okay, 
And there are combinations, but we don't have time to get into windshield mirror combinations, but there are combinations too. And it will all equal certain kinds of behavior. And so what has to happen is, if, if you're all windshield, you're an opportunist. But if you're all uh, rear view mirror, you're a realist. Um, so if I say to a person who's all rear view mirror, hey, do you want to go to the beach this weekend? Their brain goes right into the past and says, well, wait a second now. Last time we went to the beach together, it rained. So I better check the weather. They go to the past before they go to the future. So people that are strictly rear view mirrors have two speeds, slow and slower, because they got to keep going back before they can go forward. And people that are strictly active have two speeds, fast and faster, because they don't have to go back. They're always going forward. Every time there's a problem, they want to put it behind them. Just get it behind me. Just keep going. Oh, you, you sell your house. You got hurt on it. Whatever. Just make more money. Let's just keep moving. I can't worry about it. They just keep moving forward. Very, very powerful understanding how this works. All right. Now, let's get out of here. I want to look at the value framework to go along with Annoying Cricket. And this was the value framework of the person I spoke to today. Now, these are the seven value elements, aesthetic, economic, individualistic, power, sacrificial, regulatory, theoretical. And these are our passions and we, we rank them. The rankings are off. I didn't change them. I didn't have time because I was doing this right up to the last minute. Uh, so don't look at the score and don't look at the ranking on these. They're wrong. Um, I'm just, we want you just to look at the bars. Um, and so what we've got here is two things that are really important stand out to me really quickly. Blue and red are low. So low's not bad and high good or vice versa. It's just where are they in relationship to uh, the, the graph. So the 50% point, you basically, you could call zero, okay? And then zero, you could call 100 and 100, you could call 100. I don't do it that way because too many people get confused. Um, because they're not analysts, all right? So we can't make sometimes the graphs like they need to look. And so we do it so the masses aren't getting all freaked out. Uh, there's nothing worse than looking at a profile and going blank. Uh, we want people to have some semblance of what's going on. So low economic means they're non-competitive. Um, low power means they're non-authoritative and they're non-controlling. So what does that mean? It means this person's going to settle for what they can get. They're not going to fight for what they want. Ever. 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 Plus, remember, think of the other behavioral profile. Taking is low. Dominance is low. So there's no taking power. There's no determination. And there's no power to control. And there's no people to compete with. So what does that mean? It means this is a floater. This person floats through the world. They get on a raft. The current takes them wherever it takes them. They settle forever they land, and they make the best of it. That's how this person goes through the world. Period. Okay? Now, look at this sacrificial line. Okay? It's the highest line. It's about a 77 in reality, not a 35. It's a 77, sacrificial. And then their economic is very, very low. You know, it's about a 15. So what does that mean? They see the value in other people sooner than they see the value in themselves. All the time. All the time. If I said to this person, you're amazing at fill in the blank, their brain goes, really? You think so? Are you just saying that? You're just saying that because you're my friend. You're just saying that because you're my wife. You're just saying that because you're my brother. Blah, 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 blah. Their brain cannot accept it because they look at their own value and it's absent. They don't see it. What they do see is the value in other people. So they sacrifice what they want in an effort to get what everybody else needs. Okay? And this is how they go through the world. Because it looks virtuous, they're tricked into thinking they're, it's great. And that they're all benevolent and all that. But what it says is, you've got very, so low, very low self-esteem. That's what it says. You have low self-worth, low self-esteem. Okay? So we, we've got... Um, three different things here. We've got role awareness, which is where we are in the world in relationship to what we do in the earth. We've got self-esteem, you know, uh, which is what we, how we view ourselves. Who am I in the world? You know, not how good am I at what I do, but who, how good at I at who I am. Okay. So if this is really low, this is called soul frustration. 
If you're, you're all confused and not doing well in your work, it's called role frustration. And if you don't know where you're headed in the world, in, the, in your future, it's called goal frustration. Okay, so we got these three frustrated elements that have a possibility of either being frustrated or not frustrated. And so this person here likely has soul frustration. Okay, and so soul frustration says, I'm not really good at that. We should let someone else do it. I don't step up and volunteer myself for important roles. I yield my position to avoid controversy, blah, 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 blah. High regulated mindset. I'm a high regulatory, so what do I do? I hold myself to standards that are completely unreasonable. I'm a black and white thinker. There's no wiggle room. There's no gray. Um, all these kinds of things. I'm mission driven, cause oriented. I don't seek my own, you know, self. I seek other people and see how I can help them. I'm a high aesthetic, high individualistic, low economic combination. So now I'm a flipping unicorn. I'm creative. I'm like a starving artist. Uh, I don't have any money. I don't know how to get any. I, I paint these amazing paintings. I'm giving them to my friends. I don't know how to charge for them. I tell you you're an amazing painter. You say to yourself, you're just saying that. This, all this starts happening. And then on top of all this, you got that cricket sitting on your shoulder going, are you sure they're not telling you a lie about you being great at painting? And you can see what starts happening. These people are all around us. You might be one of them. They're in the world. They're in your work. All this is going on and nobody knows it. No one's aware of it, including ourselves. If it's happening to ourselves, even we are not aware of it at times. It's extremely important to understand where you are in the world. What's going on in your brain? How do you view the world? How do you view yourself in the world? What does this look like? And it's, it's important to understand that we are all different. We all have four primary emotions. And that's why I had this shirt made. It says, uncover, discover, and recover your authentic self. Who is you? What is your authentic self? We don't ever want to change who you are. We want you to realize who you are. Realize. Not rationalize. Rationalizing is telling yourself rational lies. We don't want to do that. We want to realize who we are, what our capacity for doing certain things in the world is, and then the environment that's going to work best for us. And when we put all that together, we go up in the world. We, we create flow. Flow is when your emotions, your behaviors, both character-based and intentional behaviors or concealed and revealed behaviors are in alignment and they're in alignment with your motivational framework. You're consistently leaning in a particular direction and your emotions and your behaviors are supportive of that direction. That's when you are in flow. So remember, we're not changing who you are we're helping you realize who you are so you can be the best version of who you are. So many people, when it comes to assessing and all these things and, you know, coaching in the workplace, oh, we got to get you to be like this. Basically, you're saying, get the hell out of here and bring me somebody else to wear in your clothing. And that doesn't work. This is why coaching, not all coaching works. The reason why it's looking like it's working it's because of the way the brain, it's because of brain bias. If the, I had a company pay me $87,000 to do some work for them, and they didn't listen to me. Well, how are they going to justify the, the spend? How are they going to justify it? They're going to justify where they are and the money spend, not verify as to whether or not it was a smart spend or whether or whether or not we should have listened to this guy. They're not going to verify that because if they did, they'd be looking in the mirror and saying, I've got issues. I don't know. I'm mismanaging our money. Well, they don't want to do that. No one does. So what they do is they hire you. You do what you do really well. They take maybe some, none, or a little bit of your advice. And then they justify the outcomes so that they can feel good about who they are in the world. And they're still hobbling along, not doing very well, thinking, well, my coach said this, or my therapist tells me this, and blah, blah, blah. And you still get the same problems you always had because you're not verifying whether or not it's working. You're justifying the fact that it isn't.
so that you don't have to do anything, especially if you're low dominant. And if you're low dominant, you're not going to put forth the effort because you're not a taker. You don't take control. You know, the world takes you hostage. And that's what happens. So you got to really understand this. Think about this. We all have pluses and we all have minuses. Okay? It's true with everyone. I'm super good at certain things. I'm terrible at other things. Listen, I can't spell. I can't do math. Um, there's so many things I can't do. I can't even see, for heaven's sakes. I, I blind in one eye. You can see my nose. I've broken it four times. Um, you know, I've got all these, you know, so-called negatives that my brain will look at and say, you know, that's a negative for whatever reason. We all do this. But what are my positives? I've got deep intuition. Um, uh, I'm super excellent at reading people. Um, I got all these. So what have I done? I've taken what works for me really, 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 really well. And that's all I do. All I do is what I'm excellent at. And I steer clear from what I suck at. And that makes me successful because as long as I'm in my wheelhouse, I'm good. Okay. Does that mean I'm perfect? No. It means I only do the things that come naturally that I'm really good at. And I focus on those things. And thank God I don't have an annoying cricket on my shoulder. So that's helpful. So, uh, if I did and I knew what it was and I could define it, then I could shut it up. You know, it's sort of like the movie A Beautiful Mind. Russell Crowe in the movie, once he finally realized that these people weren't real, and remember that if you've seen the movie, remember the moment in the movie when he stood in front of his wife's car in the pouring rain, when she's ready to leave him because he's psycho, and he says, I figured it out. They don't age. In other words, for 10 years, the six-year-old girl is still six in his visions. Okay, so what does he do from that point forward? He never stops seeing the little girl. He now ignores the little girl. I never stop seeing, stop seeing my minuses. I just ignore them. I get myself in situations where they're not going to bite me in the ass. Okay, so that, 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 that's what we got to do. And so you're like a battery, positive and negative, right? It takes two positive and negative posts. I say this all the time in my lectures. Positive and negative. Nobody gets up in the morning, opens up the hood of their car, takes a hammer, and breaks off the negative post on the battery so their car will run better. Nobody does that. Absolutely nobody does that. And if you did, your car wouldn't run at all. Okay? So you have to have your pluses. You have to have your minuses. They will never go away. As soon as you think you fixed one, here comes another one. You're stuck with them, so you might as well embrace them. So here's how I say it. Capitalize on your strengths. Embrace your weaknesses. That's what you got to do. Capitalize on your strengths. Embrace your weaknesses. So what you don't like about yourself, I'm telling you today, either do it right now or after this is over, wrap your arms around it and give it a big wet kiss because it isn't going anywhere. So you might as well enjoy it. And so it's important that we embrace these things about ourselves and get on with living because everybody else in the world is going to get up tomorrow morning and eat their cereal. So, you know, we can't rely upon what other people are thinking and doing in an effort for us to get moving in the earth. So let me give you some takeaways. We all have four behavioral orientations. Taking, attracting, preserving, and responding. Okay, we all have those. What is the attracting? The attracting uh, orientation, I don't think I went over it. So the attracting orientation is seeing all people as commodities with a market value. And so the better my package, the better I look, the better I sound, the more people I know that are important, the better car I drive, the better I dress, the cooler my glasses, whatever you want to call it, then the greater my value in the world. Does it work? Yes, it does work. Um, and so some people attract what they want to themselves. Like that, that person I profiled this morning was an attractor. And they have a way of making people feel like they want to do something for them. It's called the reciprocity rule. And so it creates a knee-jerk reaction in people to want to pay you back for being so sweet. Um, and so uh, it's, it, uh, hey, Deanna. Uh, yeah, me too. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's great, though. It's a good challenge. 
Um, so, you know, very, very powerful. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, boy, my mind's racing. I'm, I'm sweating buckets here. Um, I got my new... I spoke at Arizona State University and, and they got me this towel. I did two sessions and in the first session I was so wet from speaking um, that the next session somebody got me this towel and ran up on stage and gave it to me. Um, and uh, I love this little thing. Um, I don't even know the name of these people. Uh, I'm not a sports fan. Um, but anyway, the point I'm making is you, you, me, all of us, we are all highly unique in our own way. The, the question is, is our environment agreeing with us or isn't it agreeing with us? The other thing is we all have amazing earning potential inside of us. Amazing earning potential inside of us. Uh, if we're not earning what we want to earn, we're not, things aren't happening the way we want it to happen, then we call that missing the fit. And it's why it makes you feel like a misfit. Okay, we we'll feel like a misfit because we're missing the fit. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but there, this goes back many years now. Uh, uh, Britain's Got Talent. Um, and, uh, 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 Britain's Got Talent, Paul Potts. Okay, he was a, he was a car phone salesman and he sung some opera. Um, in the shower, and I think he did a couple little plays or something like that. And he was, he was, his wife asked him about going to be on Britain's Got Talent, and he didn't want to do it. He didn't think it was good enough. He had a chipped teeth, and he wasn't very good looking for the standard guy. Uh, he was overweight, picked on when he was young. He saw the value in other people sooner than he saw the value in himself, so his profile looked probably a lot like the one we looked at earlier on the values framework. Um, and then they ended up flipping a coin. They tossed a coin and heads. I'll go on Americans Got Talent and try out for it. Tails, I won't. He got heads. Tried out for the show. He gets up there and as soon as he stands up on stage, I'm reminding you, we're talking about Paul Potts. You can go to YouTube and watch these videos of his audition. But he get up there on stage and you can see the audience. They pan the audience when he's talking about himself. I want to sing opera, blah, blah, blah. They're rolling their eyes because we're judging the book by the cover. This is what everybody does. They don't read the book. They judge it first by the cover. Um, this is why what the spine of the book says is irrelevant. What the front of the book is irrelevant. What's on the back of the book is what's relevant. Because when a human being looks at a book, they flip it over. And they look at the back. Um, and so this is what we do to people as well. We, we look at these sides, but we don't look at the interior. Um, anyway, um, so he opens his mouth and starts singing. And Simon Cowell is like, I mean, he's jaw dropped. It's great to watch. Now, he was a misfit because he kept missing the fit. Why did he miss the fit? He didn't know his worth. He didn't know his talent. He didn't know his value. He had a cricket perched on his shoulder as big as Godzilla. And he just was never put into a position, nor could he figure out how to get himself into a position to realize his greatest gift. Now, here's what I'm going to say, and I want you to think about this for a second. Paul Potts was a misfit because what he didn't realize is the perfect environment for him was singing in front of the queen that 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 was his his um his perfect environment singing in front of the queen that was the furthest thing from his mind but it was the closest thing to reality and i want you to think about that Singing in front of the queen is where he's supposed to be, but nobody in any of his circles ever imagined that. So he was a misfit only because he was missing the fit. And so what you need to realize is you might feel like a misfit too. And maybe you're supposed to be singing in front of the queen. Maybe you're supposed to be at NASA instead of locked up in your bedroom playing war games. Okay, so we've all got potential. We're not realizing it because we don't get it. We're not understanding it. And my challenge to you today is to send out an email to 20 people that know you and care about you. 
Send out an email to 20 people that know you and care about you. Number one. And then ask them this. I'm doing a self-discovery exercise and I'd like you to do me a favor. Send me back five bullet points of th that represent some things of value that you see in me. And you send that email out to 20 people. Okay, what you'll get back if everybody responds, and they usually do, is 100 bullet points of value. I want you to take those words, phrases, sentences, paragraphs, however those bullet points come back, I want you to put them in a list in Word document with about 16 point font and print it. Staple it in the corner and I want you to go through each one. Each one and read it aloud, highlight it, look up the word on your online dictionary and write out the best definition, the most amazing definition of that word that the dictionary has. And I want you to keep this where it's accessible to you, whether it's in a drawer near your workstation or something like that. And I want you to visit it as often as possible and just kind of go through that list. And when you see the words, you say them out loud. So let's say one of the words is loyal. You look at that and you say loyal. I'm loyal. I'm a loyal person. My friends see me as a loyal human being. You see, we're committed more to what we confess than we are to what we think. And that's why we have wedding vows and not wedding thoughts. So when you get those words out, you start framing your world. Too many people are framing your world and they're not you. And if somebody is framing your world and they're not you, then they never frame it big enough because they have no stake in your world. You're the only person that can frame your world. So you need to start framing it in a way that works and not listening to goggly goot coming from people that don't care about you and that don't like you. The people that love you and care about you, they're the ones that see the true value. Other people, they don't see the value, nor can they. And the reason being likely is because they don't see their own. So it's important that you do this and then you go through that list and I want you to meditate on those words and start saying them and thinking of them and so forth and so on. Final thing you can do. Going through the day, you're committing tasks, you put, you're taking out the trash, you're walking the dog, you're putting gas in the car, you're getting a glass of water, whatever you do, pick three tasks a day. And when you're completed with that task, I want you to give yourself a big hug, wrap your arms around yourself and say with your mouth out loud, Steve, that's another win for us today. See, what you're doing is you're recalibrating your neural networks in your brain because your brain is like a sandbox. It's in the book, The Angry Brain, the, your brain being like a sandbox. And I think I also put it in my other book, The Four People Types and What Drives Them. Um, but your brain is like a sandbox. And when you say those things, well done, Steve, that's, a good, that's another win for us. After about 18 months of doing that, a promotion or something comes up that formally you would be like, oh, no, I wouldn't be good at that. Your brain's like, what do you mean you're not good at it? We've been winning every day for flipping 18 months. This is what your brain does. So what you have to do is get your brain focused on winning and not losing. Um, and so as you do that, it starts to rearrange your synapses, your brain gets recircuitried. It all starts changing. You can change your brain. It just takes a while. If it took you 45 years to get where you are, it ain't going to take you 45 minutes to get out. It's probably going to take you four or five years to get out. But if you're consistent, you will. And it might be sooner than you think. Well, that's all I got for you today. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. And um, I want to ask you to share this with as many people as possible because that gets this message out to the world. My goal is to help everyone I come in contact with, as many people as possible, be their best version of themselves and not be held hostage to the world's circumstances, their jobs, and all these other things that cause them to not understand and rejoice in who they are as a person. All right, thanks for watching. Um, you guys have a great rest of the week, and uh, we'll catch you next time.